Good day, or evening, if you're listening in the evening, and welcome back from your weekend. Uh, before we're fiddling around with a um, <laughs> the phone connection to Maine right now, which is good because I, n- I have a few things that I need to tell you. First of all, you may have noticed over the last couple of weeks, yeah, we got preempted here and there, and we, we're also occasionally using reruns, partly just because we're trying to get, and we have now gotten, uh, our new show, Pardon Me, which runs on the radio at noon on Saturdays, but it also is a podcast, Pardon Me, another damn impeachment show. Uh, so all the work on that has kind of distracted us. Anyway, but while we were doing all that, we were also recording some shows, some fresh new shows that nobody has ever heard. Today's show, obviously, is brand new. Tomorrow's show is our annual holiday show that we do with Jim Chapdelaine and uh, Jim uh, Jim Chapdelaine and Big Al Anderson, formerly of NRBQ and the Wild Weeds, and now a very a big deal songwriter. Uh, and we've got Nikita Waller, the state troubadour, in singing uh, a couple of songs, and we've got the uh, the uh, Dan Kosky Tabernacle Choir here singing a song. And it's I mean we've already recorded it. It's you, nobody's heard it so far. It's really fun, and that'll be on tomorrow. So if you're you're wrapping presents tomorrow or driving around doing last-minute errands uh, at 1 o'clock or at 8 p.m., if you're driving around doing last-minute errands at 8 p.m., you're really screwed. You you need something to smile about. But anyway, tune that in. It's really fun. It's always fun, but I think this year we had an especially good time, Uh, and there's some great singing. Uh, And uh, then on Thursday, also never heard before show, about kind of what we call pod culture, ranging from, I mean, the you know, Tide Pods and whiskey that's sold in pods, but also podcasting and pod hotels and um, and invasion of the body, body snatcher pods. It's all there in this uh, kind of multidisciplinary or multi-genre um, melange, a multi-genre melange. Uh, and then lastly, we'll also have a brand new nose. We're still arguing about what we're going to talk about on the nose. I think we should talk about Cats. I mean, Cats the movie musical, just because it's so gloriously and loudly deplored by everybody. It's kind of turned into a, a story. Anyway, so um, except for Christmas Day, we're all new shows this week. Uh, you've never heard them before, so spread the word. Uh, they're there for you to enjoy. Okay, so today, uh, a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk to lexicographer uh, Ben Zimmer about uh, the phrase purity test, which uh, surfaced last week in the Democratic debates. Uh, Where does it come from? What are its implications? Towards the end of the show, uh, we're going to discuss the historical origins of Christmas, the way in which uh, the origins of Christmas are at least somewhat triggered by technological change. Uh, We'll be talking to Anissa Rodriguez, uh, journalist, scientist, and former associate professor of mechanical engineering and material science at Yale. This is the mechanical engineering and material science perspective on Christmas, which you so rarely get these days. Uh, All right. But to begin, uh, one of the kind of bombshells over the last few days uh, was an editorial uh, written by the editor of Christianity Today. Christianity Today, well, we'll explain a little bit more about what it is. You've probably heard it characterized uh, different ways. Uh, But let's begin by hearing the man who wrote that editorial, Mark Golley, uh, talking about his concerns. I think what I'm mostly concerned with is the fact that it's the unwillingness of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, I'm not, again, I have no animus against them, mm-hmm. but it strikes me as strange that a, for a, people who take the, word, the teachings of Jesus Christ seriously, teachings of the uh, Ten Commandments seriously, that we can't at least say publicly and out loud in front of God and everybody that this man's character is deeply, deeply concerning to us and I, in my judgment, has, has crossed a line, and I no longer think he's fit to lead the United States of America. So Christianity Today was founded by the Reverend Billy Graham uh, many, many years ago. Family's uh, not really involved uh, anymore. Uh, the family had different things to say about it. Maybe we can, we'll come to that as we go along here. Although m- maybe let's just play A3 right now. This is Franklin Graham, the very conservative and Trump-positive um, uh, son of Billy Graham. At the same time, they're the ones who invoked my father's name. And I just thought it was important to speak out for him. My father had been so disappointed in this. Uh, so I just um, I felt that it was important that we do it uh, and let people know that my father supports the president and, and support him in this last election. And if my father were alive today, he would, he would, he would have defended himself. 
All right, Billy Graham uh, is no longer alive today. Um, there's a huge debate going on in the Graham family right now, a lot of it being conducted in the always conducive to consensus medium known as Twitter about what Billy Graham did think about Trump and whether he was you know, in a sort of a full possession of his faculties, all kinds of things. But the only person who could unthread all this confusion is Mark Silk. Mark Silk is director of the Greenberg Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life and professor of religion and public life at Trinity College and a columnist for Religion News Service. He has written about this. Um, and uh, so let's get going. His, his piece, by the way, for Religion News Service is called Christianity Today Royals the Evangelical Waters. So, Mark, welcome back to our show. Delighted to be here at a distance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Mark's in Maine right now. So you sound much better uh, on that phone. Let's. Um, first of all, I, I don't know. I kind of didn't see this coming. You follow this more closely than I do, but I'm not uninterested in this whole area of evangelical perceptions of politics and Trump in particular. I was pretty surprised when this popped up in my feed. Well, I mean, it's always good to be uh, to be up with a news story on a slow news week, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the week before Christmas, uh, when uh, Congress is you know voted impeachment and is out of dodge, uh, was a good one. So uh, that always helps. Um, and as everybody's thinking about who's supporting uh, the president, uh, President Trump, um, you know, it just hit right. But th- these things are mysteries. Right. But I mean, I was surprised. I I just see Christianity today as uh, obviously not a far right evangelical publication, but tilting more right than than what what little left there is, although there is some, you know, more moderate versions of evangelicalism. I just didn't see them invoking in pretty much the same language that they did for President Clinton, that kind of moral language to essentially condemn President Trump. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, Christianity today has been the sort of normative, middle of the road evangelical publication for a long time. And even though a lot of people, including some, you know, journalists who follow these things, think that it's, you know, it's a declining uh, voice, um, one of the things that um, my old friend and and really expert on these things, Grant Wacker, uh, pointed out is that they get millions of hits uh, on their website, <laughs> and so they continue to be important. And they they like to you know take strong positions. And uh, it's it's um, I think it's not entirely surprising, but given how cowed uh, leading evangelicals, when you think of Russell Moore, who heads the uh, Southern Baptist Convention's uh, sort of policy arm in Washington. He was pretty anti-Trump, and he was quite anti-Trump uh, in the run-up to the election. And then he's been basically shut down. So I think that's the basis for your surprise and why a lot of journalists felt, you know, hey, this is a real story. Right. I mean, we should say that obviously, given who Donald Trump has been for most of his life, um, the embrace of Trump by evangelical Christians is a little hard to understand if you just look at that at it that way. But my sense, and, and they're pretty honest about it, uh, if you catch them at the right moment, they'll say, look, we're looking for certain things. We're looking for a certain kind of judge. We're looking for a certain kind of policy on abortion. And you know, we've got a series uh, of, in, uh, of things that we're interested in. We're, we're, we're looking for somebody who has certain kind of views about the family and what the nature of marriage is. And, and so if he'll give us those kinds of people in important positions, especially in the judiciary, we're willing to look past certain things that stick to him in a more individual way. I, I mean, is that your kind of sense of how this has played out? Not with every single evangelical Trump supporter, but a lot of the leadership. No, I agree with that. And the only thing I'd add is that this is, uh, like most voting blocks, very, very stable over time. Uh, in this century, uh, the same proportion of white evangelicals has voted for the Republican candidate, um, you know, within a, within a couple, three percentage points, uh, since, uh, since George W. Bush was elected. Uh, you know, it's in the high 70s, uh, maybe as high as 81, although some people think not quite as high for Trump as that number suggests. But 
roughly four out of five of them vote for Republicans. And it means it means that there has to be a good reason for them to defect uh, in order for them to do so. And and they had and they didn't find that with Donald Trump, although, interestingly, uh, the Mormons did. Mormons are also a very strong, you know, roughly the same proportion of of what of Mormons vote for uh, the Republican candidate for president is white evangelicals. And um, where they really showed and, and they were unique in this, uh, a major shift was, you know, a lot of them didn't like Donald Trump. And so the, there was a, a substantial dis- decrease there. Right. And I mean, I think a couple of things happen. One of them is the thing we just talked about. They they want a certain set of things. And yes, they vote historically Republican because they think they're going to get a certain number of things. And in the case of Trump, he has given them, you know, in in plenitude, the you know, the kinds of judges that they, they've been looking for at various levels of the federal court. Um, so they're happy about that. And there's also that kind of cognitive thing people do once they make a decision, even if things that may have surfaced since them, whether it's the separation of families at the border or Stormy Daniels or, I mean, pick a card, um, you know, you don't like to tell yourself that you made a bad decision. So there's also probably a way in which there's they just kind of have harmonized their decision with whatever the latest revelation is. I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I don't like to be wrong. Uh, probably you don't like to either. <laughs> right. So, so you know, obviously, religion is predicated a lot on authority, and the Reverend Billy Graham isn't kind of an authority the way, say, Scripture is, or some living prophet, you know, might be considered to be. But he's damn close. Uh, and there has been kind of an interesting battle uh, over Billy Graham. What he would have thought of all of this, um, you know, we we played the clip from uh, uh, from Franklin Graham, but there are other members of the family who either don't share Franklin Graham views or there's a fight going on in Twitter about what kind of mentality Billy Graham might have been in on the day that he cast his last vote before he died. But um, Here is uh, Billy Graham's uh, uh, granddaughter, Jerusha Duford, I I mean, I may may not be saying that right, talking to Aaron Burnett on CNN uh, about all this. There's actually some truth to it. There's some policies that he's pushed through, Supreme Court justices and, you know, his stance on pro-life that I agree with and think has taken the evangelicals a long way. But my question is, how much are we going to excuse in exchange for that? The the quote I hear all the time is, he's the lesser of two evils. My fear in the lesser of two evils is eventually one of those evils stops looking evil. Right. So, I mean, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there also is your heart. Uh, and, and there's a way in which you, you, she's, I think, speaking for a lot of evangelicals and probably for Christianity today when she's starting to question, well, are we getting enough to offset the fact that we have, for very virtuous reasons, embraced this guy who really isn't up to our moral standards? And I don't know, Mark, you sort of wonder how, how do they make that calculation? Christianity today pretty, pretty clearly did say, nope, he's not worth it. Well, I think they did. I, I mean, look, the, the touchstone for Christianity today, for evangelicals generally, for uh, when it comes to politicians uh, over the years has been their personal moral behavior. Now, you and I and members of other religious groups— <laughs> You know, might say they go overboard with that, 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 you know, they make a fetish of personal morality and, you know, their people have their private lives and they get to be politicians somewhere else. But that has traditionally been the evangelical point of view. And I think one of the things that is uh, shocking to traditional evangelicals is that, is that people, uh, their, their co-religionists uh, should have been as ready as they as they seem to have been to to overlook or at least to uh, count those things not as as weighing that much uh, when it comes to Donald Trump. Uh, you know, I think um, I think I think you know we're all entitled to be a bit shocked by that 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 they're given a pass. So you know that's uh, I think that's where where Christianity Today was coming from. One of the interesting questions to ask is, well, you know, suppose Donald Trump had done all that he's done in terms of policy, and yet was like Barack Obama in terms of being a family man and being, you know, sort of without 
without sin, as far as anybody can tell, you know, when of that sort, uh, would would Christianity Today have been out there? And I think the answer is, um, you know, up in the air, but but it's very likely they would have been willing to give him a pass on Ukraine. Right. I, you know, I mean, this is something we're going to be dealing with uh, uh, this weekend, too, on uh, on Pardon Me, I'm talking to Jennifer Hurt, who's a theologian at Yale Divinity School. But, you know, I mean, one thing about Trump is he hasn't really been willing to give them anything to work with. For example, uh, during the campaign, he was asked a couple of times if he'd ever asked God for forgiveness, and he said no. Uh, and the second time, when he was pressed about it by, by Jake Tapper, he said, look, I just, my whole feeling is I don't want to have to ask God for forgiveness forgiveness. So I, I just, I'm good all the time. And, you know, and so I never do. Well, that doesn't accord with evangelical or pretty much any Christian theology. The notion ultimately is that we all screw up. We are all fallen. It's in some way we do make mistakes and we have to ask God for forgiveness. I mean, it's so different from Clinton, who for whatever Clinton's faults uh, are or were, and I, I'm happy to talk about all of those, you know, he apologized. He gathered these three pastors and uh, around him and began meeting with them regularly to examine how he could have made such a horrible mistake, how he could have committed such a grievous sin. I mean, he just played the whole thing out the way you're supposed to. And Trump, he just has no capacity even for that, Mark. No, I think that's true. I mean, one of the things that, you know, if you read uh, the, the kind of apologetics for Trump from some of these, um, uh, you know, strong supporters among among evangelical leaders, uh, sometimes called, you know, court evangelicals, um, you know, they have tried to sort of claim that he's on the road, that he's becoming a Christian in their in their sense. There's not much evidence for that. The, the other tack that some of them have taken is, uh, well, he's really, he's like King Cyrus. He's like, you know, one of these sort of pagan kings who nonetheless took care of the Jews or, you know, got them back to the Holy Land or whatever. And and so we don't have to really worry about who he is in terms of his beliefs or his uh, morality. He's just, you know, anointed by God to take care of God's chosen. And that's all we want to know. Um, it's none of it's particularly persuasive to me. But, uh, you know, people's capacity for rationalization is, um, you know, never to be uh, uh, <laughs> overestimated. So we should say Christianity Today took a certain amount of crap for, for this editorial, although they are saying right now that the, um, the rate of new subscribers is triple the rate of people dropping their subscriptions because of the editorial, and that one of the things they're hearing a lot is— well, thank you, thank you. I thought I was the only one thinking these things. It has been a real trial for for my faith and for my uh, belief to, you know, continue to watch everybody else swear allegiance to this guy who is just so obviously morally defective. So thank you, thank you. I felt like I didn't have a voice before, and now I do. And, you know, Mark, you sort of wonder, I mean, you know, if you wanted to test the Republican resolve that you talked about before uh, of evangelicals, Trump is the guy who, who could break that horse in a way, you know, because of all the things we've just said. I mean, he he is the ultimate test to which that allegiance could be put. And and maybe that allegiance isn't as strong as we thought it was. Well, I think there are certainly, I mean, anybody who's lived in the South, as I have, know that, you know, there are a lot of people going to uh, evangelical churches, Southern Baptists, uh, others who are, who are not, you know, they're, they don't belong to pedal to the metal uh, right-wing churches. I mean, there are plenty who do. And so there's a constituency out there. And I dare say that, you know, that, I mean, I know that somebody wrote me today and said, you know, I, I, I just decided to, you know, subscribe to Christianity Today as a kind of statement. I think those people, ex- you know, have existed out there and it's fine. I suspect, um, you know, that we may, we may find, you know, in, in the next two days, somebody set up an organization called Evangelicals for Impeachment and, you know, flying under the uh, Christianity Today banner. Um, you know, it remains to be seen whether, you know, that we're simply talking about those 20 percent of white evangelicals who've not been voting Republican all along, and they've just decided, you know, uh, this is a good thing. But 
nobody really knows. And a lot of the easy cynicism of journalists and the, and the sort of frenetic uh, defense of, of the supporters of Trump, um, you know, d- don't really tell us what's going to happen. I do think it's interesting that that the sort of uh, the, the degree of pushback that this editorial has gotten, if, if Christianity Today was really as unimportant as they like to pretend, they wouldn't be protesting so much. Right. Um, you know, 10 percent of 10, 10 percent of evangelicals going the other way in, in the next election is is, you know, it's going to be really bad for them. Right. Exactly. Um, so uh, there has been incredible pushback. There was a sort of a group le- statement signed by nearly 200 evangelical leaders, so-called. I don't know. One of them was like a Christian comedian. And, I mean, there were some people in there. That, it's not like everybody there was uh, a megachurch pastor or something. But um, but I noticed that Rick Warren, you know, one of the most influential and probably moderating voices in evangelical Christianity is not on that list. Not only that, but his wife, Kay Warren— uh, has picked this moment recently to criticize Trump for condoning and maybe even encouraging violence at his rallies. And and so you you do wonder, you know, you you, you wonder how strong the coalition is that the, that's trying to hold together support for Trump. We understand why they're doing it. And and it's not a bad thing. I mean, if you believe that abortion is a kind of infanticide, infanticide then you ha- you ha- have relatively little choice probably in 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 what you do politically um well i think the thing to to bear in mind is that you know these i mean any religious group is concerned about you know going to be concerned in in the first instance about you know itself its own perpetuation and when you're talking about evangelicals you're talking about your ability to witness to people to to be uh able to talk to people in of all sorts and i think it's been troubling to uh, a significant number of, of evangelical leaders, and um, you know that 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 there is such been such an association in American culture of, and increasingly so, of, of white evangelicals with with a political identity, and 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 that you know that's not good for them, and even if they get some of their you know kinds of policy priorities out of it. If their top priority, as it has always been, is to get people saved, get them signed up, get them, you know, that's that's what they're about. That's why they call themselves evangelicals. And 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 I think this this uh, really uh, editorial activates that side of things. It's not that they're crypto Democrats, as they've been accused by some of the right wing pastors uh, of being, you know, it's 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 the is that they've got their eye on the ball, which is a religious ball. Well, yeah, and it's, uh, yeah, but it's a religious ball. And so I, uh, I, some people know, I, for a while, was attending an evangelical church that was extremely gay-friendly to the point where there were three pastors, two of them were gay or lesbian. Um, So, and one of the things that I heard over and over again was this incredible pain experienced by people who were brought up in evangelical churches, came to, who came to realize who they were in terms of their, their identities, and then were told that their identities were garbage, um, and 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 didn't want to give up their evangelical faith, but also didn't. I mean, they felt felt so wounded, so torn apart. And you do wonder, you know, whether those moderating influences, you know, there might be a reason why, say, Rick Warren, you know, is is maybe taking a different view of all this. That ultimately, if you do want to witness to a lot of people you maybe have to change your tone a little bit and maybe get away from some of the harsher aspects of this just if you want to survive in a more pluralistic and democratized American society. Look, I think the you know, where you led this discussion with, with discussion, this, you know, talking about the legacy of Billy Graham, I mean, Billy Graham, particularly as, as he got older and American society became more religiously plural and, you know, he, uh, you know, had all of his world travels, um, you know, was a figure of inclusiveness. And, and, and evangelists have, you know, since the days of George Whitfield uh, traveling up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States in the 1730s and 40s, I mean, the idea that you, you know, welcomed everybody into the tent, that's, that's fundamental to American evangelicalism as it's evolved over the centuries. And, and so to have, I mean, I can tell you from personal conversations that 
this, uh, you know, sort of tension in the Graham family between some, you know, members and and uh, and Franklin Graham and his very strong, you know, sort of uh, political and partisan approach to life uh, has been going along on since before before Donald Trump was elected. And 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 so there is, you know, the, the politicizing of American politics, the degree to which the Republican Party has become the party of uh, of religion and particularly conservative Protestant religion. Um, you know, that's a matter of concern to people whose basic concern in life is to, is to spread the gospel. All right. We're going to have to stop there. But Mark Silk is a director of the Greenberg Center for the Study of Religion in Public Life, professor of religion in public life at Trinity College, columnist at Religion, religion News Service. Uh, thanks for breaking up your holiday to talk to us. Uh, delighted, as always. All right. We'll take a break. We'll come back with the amazing Ben Zimmer, linguist and lexicographer extraordinaire. All right. So public events change language. Uh, one thing we're, we're going to be talking about this uh, weekend on Pardon Me is all of the ways in which impeachment uh, creates changes in a language. I lived through the Nixon years and Watergate and Deep Six Stonewall, even the idea of laundering money. I think that was the first time I ever heard that term. So, uh, it, But it happens all the time. And Ben Zimmer, uh, our guest, a linguist, lexicographer, the word on the street columnist for The Wall Street Journal and contributing writer at The Atlantic is one of the people watching those things, watching the way language uh, gets used uh, in, in public discourse. So, Ben Zimmer, welcome back to our show. Hi, thanks for having me back. So we're going to focus for a moment on on a phrase that popped up uh, in the Democratic debates uh, last week. Uh, the, these were the Los Angeles-based uh, debates. Uh, you're going to hear presidential candidate uh, Elizabeth Warren criticize. She's criticized uh, Pete Buttigieg for a recent Silicon Valley fundraising event that was held in the notorious wine cave. Uh, uh, here's how that played out. The mayor just recently had a fundraiser that was held in a wine cave full of crystals and served $900 a bottle wine. Think about who comes to that. He had promised that every fundraiser he would do would be open door, but this one was closed door. I am literally the only person on this stage who's not a millionaire or a billionaire. So if, this is important. This is the problem with issuing purity tests you cannot yourself pass. All right. So we could be having a long conversation about wine cave, which has like turned into this whole other trope, Ben. But we're going to talk about purity test. Uh, You got interested in the use of that uh, phrase. First of all, how far back could you trace it? Well, people have been talking about testing all sorts of things for purity for quite a long time. Um, Even if you look at uh, the great lexicographer Samuel Johnson in the preface to his Dictionary of 1755, He was talking about a test of purity for language. Um, But as a fixed phrase, just a purity test in that phrase, that starts showing up, uh, you know, the earliest I found was 1864. And and through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it starts showing up quite regularly um, to refer to usually chemical testing of all sorts of substances. Uh, It could be agricultural products. It could be beverages. It could be soap, like famously uh, ivory soap is 99 and 44 100 percent pure. That was a slogan based on a purity test that Procter & Gamble announced back in 1882. Um, But then it's in the 20th century, it starts moving into some more interesting directions, political and otherwise. Right. And I mean, I I hate to go to the most sinister place here, but I mean, there was even in a way the way Buttigieg was kind of bristling when he threw out that phrase and you sense that he had it kind of spring loaded. I mean, the Nazis did purity testing. You know, they did it. They had a test for whether you were uh, a pure Aryan. Um, Lenin was kind of famous for purity testing. But this in this case, in terms of party ideology, I mean, Purity testing can be a pretty oppressive concept. For sure. And I think that that kind of connotation was what uh, Pete Buttigieg was trying to invoke. And he's certainly not the first one to invoke that. I mean, just uh, recently, just after the last debate, uh, 
former President Barack Obama was saying something similar. Uh, he said, you know, I'm always suspicious of purity tests during elections. And so I have a feeling that um, Mayor Pete's campaign was drawing from that. They knew that they were going to get some sort of uh, um, attack on the, on the wine cave front, since that had been in the news. <laughs> and so he was, he was ready with this uh, purity test response. So it is something that has been... Um, uh, used in politics generally with negative connotations. It's something that's seen as exclusionary. It's a kind of a uh, doctrinaire way of trying to fit people to a certain ideology. Right. And it's sort of, I don't know, is it a litmus test on steroids? We're used to the term litmus test. It probably was most profligately used in terms of Supreme Court nominees, and the litmus test was usually uh, reproductive rights or, or something like that. But um, did we just get bored with the linguistic toy that was litmus test? <laughs> we have to have something else now? Well, yeah, I mean, a litmus test uh, t- tends to imply just simply sort of an up and down on one particular right. issue. As you mentioned, you know, a woman's uh, right to abortion, for instance, for Supreme Court nominees. Um, but so a purity test kind of uh, implies something broader, something more stringent, perhaps, trying to weed out any types of ideological impurities, because it has that idea that you want to keep things as pure and uncontaminated as possible. When, um, you know, as Obama said when he was complaining recently about purity tests, he says, you know what, the country is complicated. The um, <laughs> the I mean, just to sort of hit on the other phrase that's in that exchange, the I thought it was interesting for Warren the way she I mean, first of all, you can hear the way she says the word wine cave. You know, it just sounds like she's saying opium den or something. Uh, <laughs> but like that's not even really a term I knew. You know, usually when a politician uses a term to attack another politician, they use a term that really is kind of so much built into the common parlance that we all know exactly what it means. Like. I wasn't, I don't know, really know, I didn't really have this embedded latent understanding uh, that that people have wine caves. <laughs> and maybe you do, maybe you travel in a tonier set than well, I do. Not so much, but you know, I had to read up on wine caves to really understand uh, what they were talking about. Obviously, there was the, you know, the, the press report, the AP first reporting about the Buttigieg uh, fundraiser that was that was held there in Napa Valley with the chandelier and the Swarovski crystals and everything. Um, and that's what everybody jumped on. Um, you know, the uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren campaigns just immediately ran with that, seeing that as their opportunity to go after Mayor Pete as perhaps not as populist as he makes himself out to be. But you're right that the wine cave itself, unless you're a wine connoisseur, you're really not going to know what that's about. And, you know, in, in fact, there's this long tradition in the uh, storage and aging of wine of uh, building, and, you know, uh, not just a wine cellar, but a much more extensive underground structure to keep your wine um, cold, you know, at the right temperature and, uh, and the right humidity and so forth. Um, and those have gotten rather elaborate, I guess, in, in, uh, in wine country out in California. Um, and so, you know, that's something that uh, the wine connoisseurs would be uh, familiar with. Uh, but for most of us, hearing about the wine cave, it, it's, it, you're, uh, you're right to say that it sounded you know, perhaps a little nefarious, perhaps it had also some negative connotations having to do with man caves, you know, whatever people might bring to hearing that phrase that they might not be too familiar with. Right. I mean, I was actually at Betty Ford with Batman, and I know for a fact that he doesn't have a wine cave anymore. Uh, he had a little problem. He got rid of it. But um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think one thing that we should say is that when when political opponents use these words, they are they're substitutes. They're proxies for something else. So I assume wine cave is code for a kind of sybarite, uh, excessive one percenter, you know, uh, hedonism or something and 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 obviously purity test is school marm moralist i think that's how buddha judge is using it yeah that's that's a great point i i think that uh the the school marm image was probably one that uh again footage is team probably uh thought about as as an evocative image and knowing that he had to have some sort of firepower to come back from 
uh, the wine cave image, which, you know, which is a strong one and certainly goes against the, again, the sort of the populist leanings that he's trying to, uh, promote. Um, to come back with that, I thought was an effective rhetorical strategy. And at the end of the night, that's, those are the, t- the two things that people actually remembered from the debate was wine caves and purity tests. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to just uh, switch tracks here. I want to be the guy who comes up to Ben Zimmer at a party with an idea. Uh, I'm sure you love people like that. Uh, oh, uh, and there's and also there's a certain hubris in thinking that I would know something or would have noticed something that Ben Zimmer hasn't noticed. But one thing that I've been tracking lately that sort of you know kind of grows out of the same kind of soil is the phrase drug deal. I mean, we know that John Bolton, uh, well Fiona Hill told us that John Bolton claimed not to want any part of the drug deal Trump associates were cooking up in Ukraine, and then De- Devin Nunes, who has this kind of charming Forrest Gump-like quality of just kind of repeating anything that he's heard. He actually used drug deal twice during the impeachment hearings to describe them. And then uh, in the Edward Gallagher, uh, Gallagher case, that was the Navy guy who you know, had been convicted uh, or had been accused of war, war crimes who got pardoned by Trump. His lawyer said uh, of the argument, bananas, completely bananas, whoever cooked up this drug deal, they didn't let me in on it. Uh, he's talking about the reported side deal for his client that, that the Secretary of the Navy might have brought up. So I don't know, Ben Zimmer, how, how many times a trope has to kind of roll over in the press before you know, it becomes something that people are saying. And I suppose this could also fade out. It could, have, could be like a, a five-day linguistic fad. But drug deal is kind of a, kind of a synonym for quid pro quo, I think, uh, seemed to be something that people were starting to use. Yeah, I mean that was really interesting when it came up in the uh, in the impeachment hearings, and I suppose we we might be able to hear more about this if John Bolton never gets to uh, testify at the Senate trial. We can only hope. <laughs> but uh, I was it was also interesting how Nunes, as you said, tried to repurpose the drug deal to talk about it's what the Democrats were cooking up. It was that that was the drug deal, which is a kind of a Trumpian strategy, just to take whatever rhetorical weapons are being used against you and just, you know, say, I'm rubber, you're glue. Um, he's done it time and time again with various phrases. I mean, fake news, yeah. for instance, was originally about, you know, these, you know, f- false news reports that were against Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, and, you know, we all know about this kind of international web that uh, produced a lot of that now on social media. He used that to his own advantage to, to, to say this is, you know, this is something that's that I'm the victim of. So Nunes was trying to pull a t- Trumpian move, I think, with a drug deal. But uh, we'll see. We'll see if that has any staying power as a phrase that, you know, sticks into uh, political rhetoric in that way. If it does or it doesn't, Ben Zimmer will be the person who tells you, linguist, lexicographer, the word on the street columnist for The Wall Street Journal and contributing writer at The Atlantic. Ben Zimmer, thanks for being with us today. Thanks. Always a pleasure. All right. We're going to take a little break now. We're going to come back. We're going to either tell you of or remind you of certain aspects of the development of Christmas that really kind of have to do with nascent late 19th century technology. All right. First, some words of thanks. Our senior producer, uh, Betsy Kaplan, produced today's episode. Uh, Kion Wolf, of course, is on the board, making the show sound terrific, as usual. Uh, thanks to both of them. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I want to just say again, tomorrow's a show we kind of look forward to every year. <laughs> then it turns out to be a big headache to put it all together. But um, it, it's a show we do where we bring in some of our favorite musicians, Big Al Anderson, a large and colorful a figure in the world of rock and pop and country music, uh, is with us along with Jim Chapdelaine and the rest of his band, Paul and Lauren, uh, the so-called floor models. Uh, we, they do a bunch of songs. We tell stories. Uh, we get some surprise visitors. I'll tell you, one of the people who rings the doorbell this year is going to be Nikita Waller, our state treasurer. Troubadour. She's going to do a couple of songs. Um, our our staff choir, the uh, the uh, uh, Dankowski Tabernacle Choir, they're going to sing a song, and it's fun. Uh, so that's tomorrow. You're driving around, doing last minute errands at one o'clock. You should listen. You're you know you're wrapping presents at night. You should listen, or you know you can listen on, at those times on the air. 
And you can podcast us, both the Colin McEnroe show and our, our other show, Pardon Me, Another Damn Impeachment, Another Damn Impeachment Show. They're both available through any podcasting platform, so don't forget that. Anyway, right now, this is the Colin McEnroe show. I'm supposed to see that periodically. I'm Colin McEnroe. This is our final segment here today. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about Christmas, which is coming in two days, uh, and uh, here to talk about some of the um, almost sort of technological or mechanical roots uh, of Christmas is Anissa R- Ramirez a journalist, scientist, and former associate professor of mechanical engineering and material science at Yale. Her most recent book, or it's actually coming, it's coming soon, pre-order it now, The Alchemy of Us, How Humans uh, and Matter Transform One Another. Uh, It will be published in the spring of 2020. Uh, Welcome back to our show. Thank you so much, Colin. So um, uh, we should say that, you know, we think about Christmas as this eternal or 2,000-year-old thing, but it really isn't, right? As a kind of holiday that, quote, everybody, unquote, celebrates, it's really kind of a product of the, the 19th century, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Uh, Christmas feel, feels old. It has a lot of old parts. Uh, St. Nick is an old bishop of Turkey, and the Christmas tree is an old German tradition. If you know the song Old Tannenbaum, that's an old German song. Uh, but the, the collection of Santa, Christmas trees, gifts, uh, and cards, that's a United States invention, and that happened in, in, in the 19th century. Right. So um, uh, we should say A Visit from St. Nicholas uh, was published in 1823, A Christmas Carol in 1843. Thomas Nast started drawing Santa Claus kind of the way we think about him uh, in the 1860s. There's some reason to believe that Queen Victoria's husband, Albert, uh, was one of the people introducing a German tradition into English holidays. That would be the tree, the Tenenbaum. So, yeah, all of this stuff starts to come together. And then there's other stuff in this. Like there's there's steel rails, which are making the world a somewhat smaller place. How does that affect Christmas? Well, two ways. Uh, first of all, it is it is making a cohesion of the United States, because before that we were ununified pockets. Uh, people would say they were from Virginia. They would say they were from North Carolina. They didn't feel American because the distances were so far away. We didn't really interface with each other. So the steel rails helped to unify us in one way because we were able to get information, people were able to move, products were able to move across the country rapidly. Uh, Think of it this way, uh, before the steel rails happened, if I wanted to go from Boston to D.C., it would have taken five days by stagecoach. It happened one day with with the trains. And so people wouldn't, wouldn't travel more than 50 miles. And so the steels brought some cohesion to the, to the country. I, I would throw in there, since we're uh, into technology here, uh, the telegraph also making the country smaller, too. I mean, oh, absolutely. The, the notion absolutely. You're sending, yeah. sending, I mean, people think about, you know, other technology. They think about phones or radios or television. The telegraph was, like, amazing in its ability to close the gap in pe- uh, for people who are geographically separated. That's right. And the telegraph and the, and the railroads were, were pairs in some ways because a lot of the telegraph lines were, ac- were along with the telephone track. And so we were able to get news from different places that were tapped in through Morse code uh, through the telegraph. So it definitely brought a, the, both those technologies brought a cohesion. But the, the thing about the steel rails is it also was able to move products. And we were solidly in the 19th century, solidly in the Industrial Revolution. We're creating more than we can actually consume. A lot of that stuff is moving across the country. And so we have to figure out how can we entice people to buy more than they need. And that's when Christmas comes into play. Right. So, uh, absolutely. And, and we should also say, before we get to that um, highly commercial part of it, the other problem is, you know, you said, well, some people would think that they were from North Carolina and some people would think that they were from Massachusetts. And up to, during, and after the Civil War, that kind of separate, sense of separation was exacerbated. There was like, well, yeah, do we even belong to the same country? So after the Civil War in particular, there was, uh, in some quarters, a real incentive to think about something that might unify. Us. Absolutely. I would actually add that technology, we were also separated in another way, uh, also by time. Before 1883, there weren't time zones. So you and I are in the same time zone because we're both in Connecticut. Uh, but if we were to travel 12 miles east or west, we would have to adjust our watch by one minute because we kept time by high noon. So the United States was just a wilderness. People who felt very regional and not connected 
separated by distance and also by time. So, uh, so we needed a great connector, and we needed a new narrative to build, put all, pull all these things together, and that's why Steel and Christmas work together. Right. So then, as you say, you know, how do you get people to buy more than what they need to subsist? And, and you know, we, we think of people started complaining about the commercialization of Christmas in, I don't know, the 1950s, the 1960s. From a certain point of view, Christmas has been a pretty commercial holiday almost from the time it became a national holiday here. That's right. I mean, it, it has some sacred parts, but it's always had a stronger secular part. And it's, and it's mostly, as James Carville would say, to move, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, we, we were deep in the Industrial Revolution. We needed to move products. And so we needed, again, to entice people to, to buy more than they needed. And, and this was difficult because, of, of course, we're coming from Puritan roots, which is all about being, being penny-wise and saving and that there's some morality to scarcity. How did we go from that to, like, the frenzy that we're seeing right now on the streets? How did that happen? Well, we had to ch- culture had to be changed, and so uh, the notion of of of, uh, of of the Puritan thinking had to be transformed to charity, where we're giving gifts. So we purchase the gifts, but we're giving them away. So that way, capitalism seemed palatable to people. And of course, we're 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 almost out of time here. We're at a time uh, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century of America of just incredibly dynamic, opportunistic, quick thinking, uh, marrying technology and commercialization. So uh, one of the things that uh, always stri- that strikes me is that so. You know, they start, people started having the trees in their houses, yeah. but they put candles on them because that was kind of the German tradition. And, of course, the trees would catch fire or they'd set fire to something else. And so Edison has this guy, Edward Hibbert Johnson, who was sort of the Apostle Paul to Edison's Jesus in terms of, <laughs> you know, introducing his technology in various ways. And so Edison's lieutenant, this guy Johnson, he's the guy who thought, what if we put electric lights on trees and suddenly you not only have something – and this is that you can sell to people who want to give each other gifts, but for people who want to participate in some of the, the, the traditions of the holiday, you've got a new product. Exactly. Well, you know, if you, I've looked at some old GE archives, and, and the language is pretty specific that they wanted people to buy lights. As Edison made better lights, and they became more efficient. People were using less electricity to put on their lights, so that the the power companies weren't happy about that because their bottom line was being affected. So they're like, "Well, why don't you motivate people to put to use more lights?" So there were advertisements to say, "Why don't you have lights in your attic?" and "Why don't you have lights in your basement?" And then after people had that, "Well, why don't you have lights on your tree?" and "Why don't you have lights on your house?" So this promotion of this Christmas tradition came again from a boardroom. Absolutely. I mean. Good intentions, too. The whole idea of gift giving is sort of a fundamentally, you know, uh, somewhat selfless idea. We're going to give each other gifts. So good, but also somebody is going to do well on the other end, right? Right. Well, we needed, we needed a way to have some cohesion. And having flying reindeer, some guy living in the North Pole, and, and elves was a fantastic idea that we could all buy into. These, these different parts of the country that which hated each other, could all buy into this notion. Uh, life was coming at us very quickly. Science was changing. There was this crazy idea of Darwinism. There was a lot of urbanism. There was a lot of immigrants coming in. Something that we could all buy into is this guy giving us gifts from the North, North Pole. So we needed a unifier, and Santa Claus was it. All right. Well, we can't wait. We can't give it uh, for Christmas. Uh, I guess you could give sort of a promissory note uh, for the book, The Alchemy of Us, How Humans and Matter Transform One Another. It will be published this coming spring. It is by our guest, Anissa Ramirez, a journalist, scientist, and former associate professor of mechanical engineering and material science at Yale. A terrific uh, way to end our show today. We'll be back tomorrow with the aforementioned holiday show. We've got a great show coming up on Thursday that's about the culture of pods. Actually, Anissa would have been an interesting guest for that one, too, wouldn't she? And we're probably going to go watch Cats or something and do a nose on Friday. So lots of new shows coming up. Uh, Plus, of course, on the weekends, pardon me, another damn impeachment show, our brand new thing that we do. 